That's okay. okay. <laughs> Perfect. So we can start here then. So to start off with, would you just like to say your name and where you are right now? My name is Judith Weaver. Judith is spelled with a Y. And that's because my father was a terrible speller. And that's how he put it on my birth certificate, not because it's my affectation. And I'm here in Seattle, Washington right now, which is not my home. <laughs> oh. I left California, 40 years in California to come up here to be closer to my son who is, whose wife is having children. So I have grandchildren. Mm -hmm. I spent half of my time up in Canada on Cortez Island. So I'm just trapped here in Seattle, Washington for the last 14 months. Oh. <laughs> Pass through. Yeah, I know that feeling. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the first real question for you is, um, who are you as a person? And that can be your values, your passions, qualities about yourself or whatever you'd like. Wow, that's interesting. You know, I think when I listened to some of the interviews and you asked that question, an answer came to me. When, if we do this and you ask me that, I'll say whatever. Right now, I don't have any recollection of that. <laughs> <laughs> Who am I as a person? Um, I'm a doer. Um, yeah, I'm a doer. And I also try to be a beer. <laughs> uh, um, I'm a mover. I used to be a dancer and movement means a lot to me. I once said that if anybody wanted to torture me, all they had to do is hold me down. I couldn't mm. move my feet tortured. Um, and I've also been a teacher to a lot of people. Sort of surprising, I mean, for me to say that, it's sort of surprising to me, but I have. I've taught in graduate schools, I still I teach in classes and workshops, so, so I'm considered a teacher by a lot of people. For me, I'm still learning. Mm. And what would you say some of your central values would be that you hold in different aspects of your life? Great question. Central values is, well, nature or natural. Um, so one of my biggest connection is with nature, even though I was raised as a city person. So my a value of mine would be as natural as possible. Um, <laughs> and right now in the way the world is today, uh, recycling is a big value <laughs> of mine. I don't, um, yeah, I recycle just about everything. Apparently. Hmm. Finding ways to reuse is a big value of mine. And, and, um, Assisting, I wanted to say helping people, but I think assisting people would be a better word. Hmm. How so? Well, assisting people to be more themselves. Hmm. So um, hopefully I'm somewhat of a bouncing board. People can, can uh, see and go no way <laughs> you know, and, and do something else or whatever it is but um yeah i like to support people help people mm. without getting too much in the way mm. okay do any other particular passions of yours come to mind dancing and moving and recycling and <laughs> well, recycling is a moving mm -hmm. part also, isn't it? Um, you ask really deep questions. Um, yeah, I'm a lot of fun at parties. <laughs> uh, I'd rather go to a party with you <laughs> rather than all that other chatter that I can't do very well. In real life. Uh, 
it's um, natural is the word that comes to mind. Not only mm -hmm. nature, but natural. Whatever the more natural and naturally that we can care for and do things, I think. Well, let me just say, interject that I'm really concerned about the world right now. This on mm -hmm. the end of May, 2021, and all that is going on is like, um, and I'm very, very concerned for the young people of the world. Um, I mean, we, I'm 82, so, you know, I'm almost trash. Um, well, and a lot of people I know are, you know, are jumping off and, and, and some choosing to be gone. But it's the young people who have spent so much time with, with devices that I can barely, you know, turn on and off. And, and what's happening with the world, with the, the warming and the pollution and the plastic and everything. And that is, that is really a, a big concern. Between that, I have that, this is the future. This is the future that we, that we're going into. And another thing that is very big in my life and has always been big in my life since I was very, very young is what has happened in the past in, you know, in um, people fighting each other. And most, suspect, um, most specifically, one of my major focuses from the time I was little when I didn't know what I was focusing on was the Holocaust. Hmm. So um, it's a lot to balance. And mostly the thing I dislike most in the world is waste. Hmm. And I must say that I think we adults have wasted, are wasting a lot. And maybe because I've been sitting here trapped because I can't cross the border into Canada where I have work and people and everything to, that needs to be done, 14 months of not being able to get there and sitting here. And it's not that I'm thinking, but I feel like I'm just soaking in mm -hmm. it, really being um, immersed in it and can't get away from it. Um, so yeah, ways. And, and this is a funny thing, but it really upsets me. When I lived in California, I don't have, I don't do garbage, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so the the um, public utilities company let me not pay for garbage because they don't pick up any garbage. There was nothing there. And once every maybe three months, I would bring a bag about this big to my daughter's house and put it in her garbage. Here in Seattle. They refuse to let me do that. I have no garbage and they charge me $25 a week. Wow. Whether I have it or not. And that yeah, really bugs me. Hmm. Because they're not acknowledging you know, a possibility. They're not open to that. Yeah, and they're giving no incentive for it to exist. Right. right. Hmm. I don't need the incentive, but I put the empty thing or the almost empty, I go, I go looking around for garbage and mm. something out, but there, you know, there's nothing there, but, but it feels, it's a, not a, yeah, it is, it's a trap and it's also like a stuck place. Mm -hmm. So every week I face that. And there's something about waste. We have wasted a lot. Mm. Yeah. Hmm. Well, so I, I'm interested, I mean, in where that interest of yours in the Holocaust came from. Um, I don't know if you'd like to say something about that. Sure, I, I'd be glad to because it's um, probably, un well, maybe not terribly unusual, but, but I, I was the only one who, when I was growing up, I would uh hear about things and wonder i mean when i was old enough to wonder i would wonder why i was in whether it was detroit michigan or rochester new york where i lived my first decade why i was there 
and why there were people my age, younger than another country, rubbing themselves with, with cakes of what they thought was soap, but it was concrete. Why I was here and why what was happening to them there, I don't know how I even knew about it. Mm -hmm. Because nobody really talked about things like that. Um, so I was born in 39. Um, so I've always had that and many, many other questions and many, many other concerns. <clears throat> and one day in California, maybe 30 years ago, um, when I was studying biodynamic cranial sacral therapy and um, a colleague of mine and I, we had a practice session and um, I was lying on my bed in Mill Valley, California on a sunny day with the sun coming in and this chiropractor a buddy of mine had his hands on my head and I started seeing. Mm. You know, first I had a, something that I saw and then all of a sudden it turned to mud, to gray, to gloom. And all of a sudden I was a 17 year old girl standing on the edge of a pit, naked, mm. terrified. I was shaking, I was so terrified. And I was so angry. And there in the distance was, was a, a Gestapo, you know, and I'm standing there and I'm trembling with, with anger, really. And, and I'm lying on this bed with the sun coming in and this guy not knowing what's happening. And I say to him, I've been shot. And I had a pain underneath my left breast, like I've never had before or since. Mm. I said, I've been shot. And then there was a great big boot on my lower back, my sacrum, where I've always had problems. And I got kicked and pushed into the pit. And I could feel, I could feel movement underneath me. It was like worms. Mm. It was people underneath there. And, and that's what I saw. And um, I went, that's impossible because I was alive in Detroit, Michigan, at Rochester, New York, at that, at that's impossible. And so I had the opportunity to speak to Brian Weiss, the man mm -hmm. who wrote, you know, books on past lives. And I said to him, how is this possible? He said, no problem, parallel lives. And I went, huh? Hmm. I know a little glitch in the matrix there. Yeah, well, I know Peter Levine well, because I knew Peter Levine before SE happened and I known him for years and I spoke to him and asked him about it and he said the same thing he said oh no, no problem parallel lives and I'm going yeah and finally I spoke to someone else years later and told him the story and I said how is that possible he said well you know when you when you are incarnated it's not a hundred percent into this other person there's you know 30 percent here 50 percent here 20 percent here and i went oh you know that made sense to me mm -hmm. there's a little piece of you somewhere else yeah mm -hmm. so i could very well have been there and have been you know suffering in detroit michigan too mm. or whatever it was but that really did explain a lot to me and then i spoke to someone um another you might say entity who really could feel what I was saying and said, yeah, there were a lot of women and children underneath you. And they were trying to get up the air. So without me knowing that I was that there was my connection. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, Seattle is not my favorite place to be. I never would have chosen it. Um, but there is a, a very small, very well done Holocaust Center for Humanity. And I've been mm. docent there for ever since it opened and since mm. I heard about it. So I, I have been very involved and met a fair amount of the survivors and taken you know, tours of school kids and everything. And that feels very good and clean mm. to be able to do it, to mm. share, you know, let other people know and come to understand. Mm. So I, I would normally ask about an event 
or a set of circumstances in your life that you would say have shaped you, that may be one of those, you know, in your life and not just of your life. But I, I wonder if there was something else that came to mind. Actually, there was. And it came to mind as I was talking about this. <clears throat> when I was six or seven years old, it was Rochester, New York, I used to go to go to sleep holding my eyes back, wanting them to slant before I woke up. And I wanted long black hair. And I wanted to grow up and marry the Dalai Lama. Number one, nobody knew who the Dalai Lama was in Rochester, New York, <laughs> 1947. Um, uh, if there was anything about Asians, it was the dirty Japs, you know? Wow. So there's no wow. reason for me to want to uh, be that or do that. But that was, um, that was an interesting time that has always been with me. And actually many, 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 many years later, when the first time, and I have, I've had the, the honor and the luck to have been with the Dalai Lama many, well, several times, not many times. I could use a few more actually, it was wonderful. But the first time I saw him, it was a public thing and there were lots and lots and lots of people and we waited for hours. And when we, when we get up, you know, you get up and, and he says, Tashi Dile, and you go off. And he said, Tashi Dile, he took my hand and what came out of my mouth was, it's so nice to see you again. And then I went off, I thought, who said that? Hmm. Um, um, so that's always been with me since I was very, very young. But the probably the biggest thing that changed that changed my life that has mattered so much in my life to me was after being an, an aspiring dancer in New York City again. Movement <laughs> didn't want to, didn't want to. Um, stay still. I went to Asia. Hmm. I went to Japan. China was closed at that time. This was 1965, 64, 65. And um, after dancing there, teaching dance and studying Japanese classical dance, kabuki and no and all of that, I followed the other passion that I had, which was studying Buddhism. And I entered a Zen Buddhist monastery. Hmm. And um, uh, to make a long story uh, concise, I was very, very lucky to have been, I mean, I for, by that time I was, had been in Japan for over a year. I, all, I can, almost became the first, world's first foreign geisha <clears throat> until I really understood what the social system was with, with the husband staying out late and getting drunk and, and I didn't wanna have anything to do with that. Uh, but I was I, basically when I was driven to enter a monastery, I forgot number one that I was a woman, and number two mm. that I was Caucasian, because Japan Japan felt very very comfortable to me, more comfortable than the United States ever was. And I mm. wore Japanese clothes and I wore kimonos better than I wore Western clothes. Mm. I wasn't comfortable in Western clothes until really I came back and took off the. <laughs> the strict kimonos. <laughs> um, I was allowed by a very enlightened, compassionate Zen master to be the only woman in his monastery of 30 monks. Wow. Yeah. And it was, it was a very traditional, very, very strict Zen Rinzai monastery, which is sort of like the Marine Corps <laughs> of Buddhism. <laughs> And I was there for a year and a half. Hmm. And, um, and that, that changed me a lot. Certainly wasn't going to go back to New York and try to be, you know, my ego wasn't there to want to be on this, hmm. do any dancing. And um, it led me in different ways to actually even, um, when I came back after, after three years, actually after two and a half years in 
in Japan and a Buddhist pilgrimage through Southeast Asia, I ended up in Mexico. I was asked to go there and help start the first Zen center in Mexico City. Oh, okay. <clears throat> 1968. But when I realized that the Mexican psychotherapists really just wanted to have a Zen center there so they could send their clients to be babysat. And I thought every Monday night I was babysitting these, mm. the, the, the psychotherapists never came for it to sit. They just wanted their people to. So it was sort of strange. And I decided, uh, no, we got it. I, I'm out of here. And I came back, left the, the Japanese monk there who became well known and started a center, which is maybe even still going on. No, I wouldn't be surprised. There's quite a few. Yeah, yeah. And, and there are connections mm -hmm. to them. Um, hmm. But uh, one of the things that happened to me when I was in Japan, speaking to uh, Ruth Puller Sasaki, who had her own Zen center in Kyoto, um, she said to me one day, she said, so my dear, what did you do in the United States? And I said, well, I was a a struggling dancer and I worked as a secretary to earn my money to pay for the dance classes. And I said, so I was a secretary, but I don't have to do that anymore. And I was sort of saying, well, I've been in a Zen monastery. I don't have to do that anymore. And she said to me, why not? And it was like a light bulb going chung. And I thought, she's right. It's not that because I've been in a Zen monastery, I don't have to be a secretary anymore, but it really is because I've been in a Zen monastery, if I have to be a secretary, I can be a better secretary. Mm. And one day in San Francisco, somebody opened the door and said to me, I hated typing and I'm a terrible typist, <laughs> said to me, do you know how to type? And I said, yes. They said, would you like a job? <laughs> and I thought, no, but I learned no judgment. You know? okay. I said, okay. So I was hired for a week to type Esalen Institute's first newsletter. <laughs> okay. They had moved from Big Sur. They opened up a branch in San Francisco and needed somebody to type their newsletter. So I, I did the best job I could, <laughs> true Zen fashion. And they liked me enough and hired me to continue working okay. there. And eventually I met is a long story shortened um, somebody who became my my husband who was the director of Esalen at that time and I was down there a lot and um, and one of the first things I did which is just happening when I came there Fritz Pearls was giving a workshop and so I sat in on that workshop and long story short I mean of course I was there a lot Fritz knew me a lot the last time I saw him, we had dinner at a Japanese restaurant in San Francisco, but he loved the fact that I had been to Japan because he loved Japan when he was there. Mm -hmm. um, and so we talked mostly Japanese stuff and food. <laughs> so moral of the short story is say yes to the typing job. <laughs> <laughs> or just don't judge, you know, and do yeah. whatever comes to you do the best you can. Interesting. Okay, well, you've mentioned a couple times, I mean, I get some sense of the dimension of the depth of your history. Um, but how are you experiencing your age and the aging process Oy. these days? <laughs> um, painfully, physically painfully. Mm. Uh, not mentally painfully. I appreciate all that I've done, that I've been through, that I've been able to share. Um, yeah, and um, it's sort of like an adventure that you really never wanted to go on, <laughs> meaning, meaning uh, every day it's, is it this a new pain or is this going to go away or how can I stretch or what do I do? So it's definitely, 
interesting, which you know is a Chinese curse. Do you? To, to say you it's interesting? interesting times. Oh, yes. It's a Chinese curse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's interesting in that, in that uh, form of interesting. And mm -hmm. it's definitely, in, yeah, I never expected to live this long. Oh. And uh, it's like, really? <laughs> it really is a surprise. And sometimes I do things, I'm going, well, I'm 82 and I can still you know, touch the floor, you know, touch my toes or whatever it is. It's, um, it's interesting <laughs> uh, in all realms of that word. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm also curious, you said you sort of forgot that you were a woman for a little bit, but I'm wondering how you understand and experience yourself in terms of gender or as a woman. Wow. One thing I remember, um, beginning studying psychology, and I just found, you know, I'm, I'm, going through my books and sending a lot of them to the Wilhelm Reich Museum, uh, send, giving a lot of them to the libraries to sell. And I found the paperback version of Freud's, what, 28 lectures or anything, this old book that I bought in the 50s with my you know, Florida address, my high school name in it. And I mean, it's yellow, it's underlined, it's falling apart, but I remember reading it and going, I have no, penal envy. I am just so glad I'm a woman. I don't know what he's talking about. That's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So um, given all of the issues <laughs> about it, I've always been glad that I have had the female, you know, um, what orientation this time. Um, Yeah, I think I have had it for a lot. One of the things, and talking, one of the things years ago, 40 years ago, Cindy Sheldon and I were in a group with a, probably the most famous psychic in California at that time, Ann Armstrong. And we would meet every month with a whole bunch of really interesting people and do things. And Cindy brought the uh, brought up the prospect of doing some past life work. And so the, the, the psychic who was sort of leading it, eventually it became everybody was leading it, um, said, sure. And we did a lot of that. And I must say, um, female has been my, my modus operandi for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, except when, well, Japan was different. I was so, I had been there so many times in past lives um, that I really just submersed myself into it and basically forgot. I mean, I wasn't looking in the mirror. So all I saw were Japanese people sort of forgot that I wasn't. Mm -hmm. um, and I was very much so. I, I moved like them. When the students I was teaching English to the first year I was there asked me about music. They wanted to know about Kurezuli and the Beatles. I didn't even know who they were talking about. I could talk to them about Naganuta, you know, all sorts of Japanese classical music. Mm. All, the, all these things, it was just so funny. Uh, and, the, and the term, Mezurashi gaijin, strange foreigner. <laughs> <laughs> I have a feeling I might hear that one if I ever go to Japan. Um, so, but I, I really did forget and it, and it took me, it took, well, I, I just never, I was just, was there in the monastery. I was I mean, gonna say, was, is that forgetting or is that sort of transcending? Good point. Um, not paying attention to, I think I would call it more. I don't know if I transcended. Certainly they weren't. I mean, there were some monks who were very unhappy mm. that I was there. In fact, I wasn't. Uh, 
usually they would have someone like a foreigner or especially a woman go sit in the hondo, which is the big room where, where nothing happens. But I asked to sit in the zendo where all the monks were. Mm. And so, and there was a little bit of unhappiness, shall we say, about it. Mm. So in the order, there was the, you know, the head monk and then the next monk and then all the way down. And then there was this great big space. And then there I was, the, the right at the bottom. And whenever it rained, I was the only one who got rained on or snowed on or anything. And I mean, it was, there were um, interesting discriminations that I wasn't mm -hmm. even paying attention to. I was just so much there. I can't even say I was glad to be there. I was just, it was like, hmm. okay, here's something for me to do. The bell rang and I followed. Um, oh. In fact, there, there was a, <clears throat> once a year in this Zen monastery, there is a day and it's the winter solstice, the day where the rule is to go against all the other rules. And, and they do, they do. They bring in cases of sake and all sorts of things and, <laughs> and have a dinner that evening. It's to change the yin to yang and to start the, mm -hmm. the new year over. And, um, and there was a big banquet that I helped cook with, a cook for with the monks. And finally that evening there, was, there were guests and one guest came up to me and said, what are you doing here? You're a woman, you're a guy, a foreigner, get out of here. And the head monk came up to him and put his hand on his shoulder. And he said, you know, it's okay if she's here. She sits with us and you know what? We even let her use our toilet. And I knew I had been accepted. Hmm. Hmm. Strange times that I, I wasn't thinking about. Now that I think back, I go, ooh, you know, that's really neat. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I was able to do that. It seems neat in that it wasn't a, a, a willful, challenging, violent kind of invasion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So what about power and privilege in your life? How do you experience those? Wow. That just gets me right here in my gut, um, the privilege part, because I'm so aware of that now, and even with, yeah, with everything, um, clothes, food, vaccine, you know, so many things. Um, I never felt very powerful. I was, um, raised as a poor Jewish person. So <laughs> it was sort of like two, two uh, marks against me in a way, where, mm -hmm. where I first moved most of my, from when I was 10, my family moved to Miami, Florida, and we lived a half block away from Color Town. So I was very, very aware, aware of, pre I was horrified on the train going down, stopping at some station and seeing two water fountains out there, one for whites and one for color. It never occurred to me. Um, but then it did occur to me a lot as I was there a half block away from the railroad tracks and whatever else was happening. And there was that. And then I was stoned for killing Jesus. Oh, yeah more than once. And one time I remember being tied to a tree and they shot arrows at me. And it was always because I had killed Jesus. And I was taught to say, no, I didn't. The Romans did and turn around and I would run as fast as I could. But I was a little tubby and I couldn't run very fast. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Running from arrows for having killed Jesus. Mostly it was stones. Just one time it was arrows. That's when I got caught. Oh, well, just, just one time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But more hmm. than once it was stones and you killed Jesus, you killed Jesus. No, I didn't. The Romans did. That's what, wow. <laughs> that's all I really understood. Hmm. And growing up in segregated America. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I uh, went to Robert E. Lee Jr. High School. 
Hmm. No questions asked. He was just up there on a white horse in the auditorium. But, and there were no questions asked, no awareness, hmm. except this is the way things are. Hmm. I, I have a feeling you didn't stick with that model. No. <laughs> what, <laughs> what happened? How, where did that critical thinking just kick in? Well, I got out of Miami as fast as I could. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, worked for a year after high school graduation and left for New York, which was definitely a breath of fresh air, you might say, even though it was dirty fresh air. Mm -hmm. um, and tried to live. I mean, in high school, I remember being being the big, I was the only person that spoke in favor of gay people. Hmm. I don't know why or how I did it, I just, but I do remember sitting there <clears throat> and saying that if two people were mature enough and, and loved each other, they should be allowed to whoever they were, whatever color or, or gender they were. Hmm. It was high school in Miami, Florida. Um, I think I became, you know, I, nobody responded. <laughs> I remember everything being very quiet there but mm. nobody responded, but I had to express my opinion and how I felt. And then in New York, I remember being very, uh, well, it was the dance world. Um, and interestingly enough, it was the year the West Side Story opened on Broadway. Ooh. Yeah. Saw uh, the whole West Side Story three times, saw the last half after intermission 17 times. <laughs> I have a friend who worked at the theater. You, know, you just wait for intermission and then you go in with them and if there are any seats or you do a standing room. Hmm. After, after intermission, they don't kick you out. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Broadway tips. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. So I'm also curious who you would say has had a significant impact on your life? What other person or people? Well, well I, the first person that came to mind was the Dalai Lama. I think he's just such a wonderful person. Um, but then secondly was my, my Zen master who allowed me to stay. Mm -hmm. And when I asked if I could go begging with the monks, for instance. He said, no, <laughs> he said, no, you can't. He said, in the 3,000 3, year old history of Zen in Japan and the 700 year old history of this monastery, there has never been a woman that's gone be begging with the monks. It, it was not begging for much. It was just, you go and chant blessings, you know, mm -hmm. they give you whatever couple of pennies or something. And, and I, wouldn't, I wouldn't let him go on it. I said, you mean, I'm sitting in the Zendo <clears throat> and I'm sweating blood just like all the other guys and you're not letting me? What's, what's this prejudice? What's this discrimination? And he looked at me and he said, okay, but wear your hat very low. Or these <laughs> hats, you know, so that nobody would see, which I did, except the little kids on their tricycles. Mm. See, and they'd say, they would see my nose and say, God, you know, foreigner, foreigner. Mm -hmm. so, um, so those two people, and interesting that they're both men. It's mm -hmm. um, no, that's what comes to mind. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, so I'm, I'm interested in a little bit more about the Gestalti parts of you. <laughs> as well. Um, I mean, you said you got to Gestalt through that secretary position and via Esalen, or was there another connection for you? Um, <clears throat> no, I had really just come back from three years out of the country. Mm -hmm. And ended up in Esalen having dinner with Fritz Perls. Well, that took a while. <laughs> okay. I worked as, as secretary for Esalen Institute for quite some time. Mm -hmm. And then I would go up and down a lot because I became, um, well, the, the, two, the two things that I really took up after I left, besides 
working as a secretary to feed myself was uh, Tai Chi Chuan, which is what I had looked for a lot before I left. And every time I saw a Tai Chi teacher or went to a class, it just didn't feel right. Mm -hmm. But after I came back, I did hook up with the person, the, the right teacher for me. And that was what, 1968, and I'm still doing and teaching the Tai Chi form, so it's been a while. Mm -hmm. um, and the work, the work that is called Sensory Awareness, Charlotte Selver mm -hmm. and Charles Brooks, and um, was sort of like two, two practices that I undertook is immediately, I found them when I immediately came back. And you might say that one is form, Tai Chi, and one is formless, the sensory awareness. Mm -hmm. So I studied with Charles and Charlotte, well, since 1968 and on, and I started leading sensory awareness in 85 or something. But every time Charlotte was giving a workshop down at Esalen or San Francisco or wherever, followed her to Mexico, Monhegan Island, all different places. I was, I was there, it was, was and still is very, very important work. Um, I forgot what your question was. It was actually how you came into Gestalt. Oh, okay. So, so there was um, a lot of that up and down to Esalen. Um, and eventually connecting with the person who was the director at that time. In fact, I sort of got him fired by, he was supposed to go to Cowichan, mm -hmm. where, where Fritz had formed thing there. And I convinced him, Cowichan and British Columbia, I convinced him to go to Mexico to work with Charlotte Selver with me. And he got fired for doing that. Oh. As, as director, yeah, so, oh well. Um, uh, so Charlotte and Charles and Fritz had a really good relationship. I mean, uh, Fritz, well, Laura Pearls studied with Gindler, Charlotte Silver's teacher back in the mm -hmm. 30s, 40s. Um, and Fritz, in 19, when I wrote one of the articles about Elsa Gindler being, well, the mother of, of body psychotherapy uh, and Wilhelm Reich being the father of it, connecting that Reich con working with the body and breath and muscular armor was really influenced by his middle wife, his second wife, Ilse. Um, Ellendorf, who studied with Gindler. So mm -hmm. Gindler really influenced Reich. And of course, Fritz was influenced by, by um, well, Laura doing the work with Gindler. And with in, in New York, Fritz, for a year and a half, took private lessons with Charlotte. He would never go to a class. Mm -hmm. And um, which is probably best, <laughs> that was probably <laughs> smart. Um, Might have been a little bit disruptive. Or... Yes, I think he would have been. <laughs> yes. And he actually wanted Charlotte to work with his clients. Hmm. And Charlotte in her wisdom said no. Hmm. I mean, she was not you know, a psychotherapist or anything, but that would have been not a good thing either. So, but when I was writing, co-writing with, uh, two psychotherapists in Europe about the lineage. One of them found letters that were written by Fritz to Laura in 1947, saying, look what I have just discovered. This mm -hmm. is what I need to my add to my, what concentration therapy, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And and this is, you know, this is so wonderful. This, this completes it, it really makes it. So, Fritz and Charlotte especially had a great connection. <laughs> um, and um, so I would see them a lot at Esalen. And the, the time we were all 
by different parts. I don't know if, if I don't think I drove up from Big Sur with him, but it was a, um, it might have been, Fritz was on his way out of California, going into Canada college. And it was a Japanese restaurant in the mission. Um, and that was the last time I saw him. And he mm -hmm. talked a lot about Kyoto. I figured he liked the Japanese women. Um, but um, I did take some other workshops or classes with Fritz down in Esalen. And then so many, many, many times after he left, when I was giving my own workshops, I loved being assigned to Fritz's house to do mm. the work there. Mm. It was always, it definitely had his uh, flavor. Mm. So would you at any point have considered yourself a Gestalt therapist? Is that part of, or was this just something that sort of crossed a lot of different fibers in your life? Um, then it was just something that crossed a lot of fibers in my life. I remember Stella Resnick being in one of those evenings that we had at Fritz's house, mm -hmm. Seymour Carter and a whole bunch of other people. But later on in San Francisco, I did go to the Gestalt Institute there that Cindy and, and Frank Rubenfeld and some others formed. And so I studied there. Mm -hmm. and like Willie and I were in the same class. Okay. Yeah, I remember her there. And, um, and so I did, I, I don't remember how, whether it was a two or a three year program. Uh, Abe Lewinsky was one of the teachers there. There were so many. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's when I never really, I felt myself a Reichian based therapist, mostly mainly good movement, you know, mm -hmm. um, breathing, all of that. But, and uh, Gestalt, if there was anything else, it would be Gestalt too. And when I moved up to Seattle and Cindy said that they had formed this little group of Gestalt therapists, I said, well, I'm not. A, she said, yes, you are. And that's when she told me, you know, about you and I said I'm not gestalt enough and she said yes you are <laughs> yeah yeah she said you'd you you were going to say that you weren't gestalt enough <laughs> that was that was the warning but so I, I'm just curious I mean what was there in gestalt for you I mean ah great um the the reality the the realness of it hmm. the realness of it that it was um people being real or trying to be real or looking at themselves being real or not being real. Um, yeah, people having the courage uh, to, to get up there and, and be real. In fact, I, a memory just came to me. So when Fritz was there, he was always in, in the, in the lodge with a lot of people. After Fritz left, there were smaller groups. And I remember we were having one in my house. My daughter was, well, she was walking and talking, but she was maybe two years old. And somebody was um, doing a session, uh, either yelling or pleading with his, and it was a male, with his mother about, he just wanted to be, what was it? He just wanted to be real. He was talking to the, this pillow, it was a pillow in our living room. And he wanted to be real, he wanted to be real. And my, my little toddler daughter came up to him and said, okay, be real, <laughs> and then toddled away. <laughs> it's, it's that kind of realness in Gestalt. Mm -hmm. that I really, that I do appreciate. Hmm. Hmm. More than appreciate, I really, I was gonna say, I, I really love it because it is so necessary for us to try to be real. Hmm. That's interesting. I mean, cause you talk about a lot of disciplines that have form and 
where where does that realness or that authenticity ah. clash with form or does it yeah no i mean because real isn't necessarily form i mean so tai chi has a form but sensory awareness certainly doesn't um yeah so there's you know there's both of that and and yes and i think gestalt has both hmm. yes there's a form and there has to be the formlessness to grow out of. Mm -hmm. the, uh, just before Cindy passed, the last week, some, one of the students, one of her students sent her a bunch of photographs while she was in mm -hmm. the hospital. And <clears throat> a lot of them were of Mill Valley, where we had both lived. And one of the photos had the building where we shared offices right there. But then another one, it was a series of photos from Esalen, and several of them had Fritz in them. Hmm. One of them um, was it was probably up in, in his room. It was sort of cozy where he was there, and there was another student behind him, and he was another student. It was a really nice picture, and I thought that the student behind him was um, Frank Rubenfeld. So I sent the photo to Frank. I said, this is a nice picture of Fritz and, and you. And, and Frank wrote back, he said, I don't know if that was me. My hair was different at that time, but Fritz was certainly flipping his nose at the world, wasn't it? Which is what he always liked to do. And it really was. I mean, Fritz is there with his cigarette and everything and his hands on his nose. Hmm. That was so real. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. So what would you say then is sort of the essence of, I don't want to say work, um, but the essence of your practice or what you do with all of these things in your life. Yeah. The essence of my practice has um, filtered down to a basis of, of more sensory awareness than anything else. Like if somebody tells me, uh, I say, what are you feeling? And they say, I'm feeling anger. I say, well, how does anger feel in you? Because of course, anger in me would feel differently. I don't understand you if you can't with just that word. So for me, it is, I don't know how I could be doing this without the the basis the help the basis of sensory awareness mm -hmm. um what i've come to and in my own study um uh, that eventually i got you know reiki and therapy gestalt therapy sensory awareness but then i had to go to pre and perinatal issues because i have some very severe ones. You might say I died at birth and then my mother died when I was three in childbirth. But wow. that, that um, field has given me a lot of understanding and experience so that I can understand a lot of what other things happened to me. And of course, so much of that is pre-verbal. Mm. So I can't do it with words. I don't want to do it with words. I'm not a big word person. So, so bringing in the, well, it used to be touch, but now with the pandemic, I mean, even doing it over, um, over Zoom, it's possible. Bringing, trying to guide people I can't bring anyone anywhere, but guiding people into their own sensations without judgment. And so, um, and I think Fritz did that a lot. And I think he got that from, you know, sensory awareness. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. So I'm wondering what some of the challenges that you've run up against you would say have been <laughs> life <laughs> world <laughs> yeah, that. lately humanity <laughs> right which of the 82 years <laughs> yeah 
I mean, some of my questions like end up feeling ridiculous when I ask them, but it's, I, I still ask them. I have no problem being ridiculous. Yeah, yeah good. Challenges. Mm -hmm. um, well, there's so, so many things are happening, but uh, let's see. It was at, at a class at the Gestalt Institute in San Francisco where I met someone, had no recollection who he was, who said, oh, you should be teaching at the California Institute of Asian Studies, which is what it was then. And actually I was, and he spoke to the Dean and I was interviewed by Ralph Messner, the Dean, who hired me because I had the PhD in Reiki and psychology, hired me to teach Tai Chi at this school, which a year later or two years later became California Institute of Integral Studies. So um, for since 19, whatever it was, um, for 25 years I taught and offered many, many classes that were unlike any other classes that were at the school, uh, East and West psychology, body mind you know connections uh art body culture you know movement and things like that so there were a lot of challenges in fact i was even called in one day and and sort of challenged because i fired someone in the tai chi class <laughs> I, and not fired i flunked them mm -hmm. and and the brain dean said how in the world can you flunk someone in Tai Chi, I just, you can't do it, you know? But there were also, so my classes were different. Hmm. I'm sure I wasn't the only one. Angelus Arian taught there too, and her classes were very different too. So there were, there were some, but they weren't the regular brainy graduate school mm -hmm. to do all that research and write a thesis hmm. class. So I'm, I'm also wondering, and I'm trying to frame this as respectfully as possible, but have you ever run into like a, any kind of a challenge about cultural appropriation in the work that you do? Or, I mean, is it just because there's so much depth in your experience and your studies? Is it? Yeah, that's interesting. It's just, are you, my daughter just brought this up recently. And it never occurred to me because I'm still have uh, probably cultural dystopia or something. She said that there are Asian people that really don't like Caucasians who are doing Asian things. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, I, I'm just curious. <laughs> Until my daughter brought it up, I went, oh, wow. Mm -hmm. And I asked her to give me the name of the woman. This is just last week or something. And I understand that. I really do. But no, I haven't mm -hmm. yet, I guess. Uh, but I would like to hear what these people say more. Yeah, I mean, it was I'm, where I went to university, I realized there wasn't a single Latino, Hispanic, or even Spanish person giving Spanish history, culture, language, and literature courses. And I was kind of like, mm. wait a minute, what? The, what? And now I'm a white Canadian born naturalized Mexican citizen. And I, when I when I say a Mexican we, I'm kind of like, wait a minute. Mm. Um, yeah. But it's, yeah. Yeah, I, this is very interesting and I'm going to, I'm sure I'm going to be more aware of it sooner, but I've always felt I don't like borders. I think anybody who wants to go wherever they want to go should be able to go there. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I do think it would naturally even out. You're not going to want to go someplace if there's nothing there, or if there are too many mm -hmm. people or something, that it will even out. And how about letting people use their own uh, intuition, their own intelligence, rather than be a number? Mm. So, uh, no, I haven't, 
except there's one funny picture coming to mind when I first went to Japan. A Japanese man who I dated in New York was there then and and a whole bunch of his friends and everything and I didn't speak yet. You know, I got to Japan with three words of Japanese even though I had studied it. Um, and one was shikata ganai which means oh well there's nothing you can do about it that, that didn't work all that well except these young people were talking, talking, and talking, not paying any attention to me. But I remember one of them must have reached or something for them. And I picked up and gave the whatever it was they were reaching for. And everybody stopped and said, she understands. <laughs> and I didn't understand a word. I was reading their body language. Mm -hmm. I get in trouble for that. Yeah. But... Um, for appropriating other people's culture. It's something that, um, well, I have so, such respect for it. Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, I, I understand that there, you know, there's a difference between appreciation and appropriation and things like that. I just- uh, Yeah, yeah, but I do want to be more, more um, aware of that. Yeah, I mean, more than challenging you myself on it, I was just curious if that was something you had run into, really. Yeah. Hmm. I have more trouble with being Jewish than who do you think it is? <laughs> okay. Yeah, that sounds like that was definitely very challenged. Hmm. Well, I mean, on the other side of the challenges, um, what would you consider some of your satisfactions? Hmm. Hmm. I'm looking out the window because I have chickens here. Oh. And I raised them from you know one day old and they're now a year old and they're laying beautiful eggs. And because they've been touched so much, they really want to be picked up and they yell at me if I don't. <laughs> mm. One of them jumps on my back or pecks me if I don't pick her up. So mm. it was you know, something that worked out well. Um, gardening, nature, mm. what was the word? Satisfaction. Satisfactions. Nature. Hmm. Um, I am in this being st stuck here in this uh, time where the weather is definitely not you know, uh, good for me. I am so grateful that I have a large yard with green and things happening. If I were in a condo with a concrete wall, on the other side of my window, I'd probably be nuts. Yeah, I'm just about there. I've spent 14 months in a concrete box. <laughs> really? Yep. Oh, I'm so sorry. But you have two kids, so that keeps you I safe. I do. Oh, no, no. There's lots of lively nature with two dogs and two hamsters and two kids. But <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not a horizon. So I understand that. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. So... I'm also curious, sort of as an ending point, um, where are you going from here? What's next? Oof. Well, I'm waiting for the border to open. I was going to say, I'm sure as soon as they open the border, <laughs> you'll be shooting up north. Oh, but boy. Yeah, what I have four. What, what, what are your projects? What's, okay. what's coming up for you? Well, I had three workshops last year up there that I had to cancel. Mm -hmm. And four in Europe that I had to cancel, but I'm not going to be flying much anymore. Mm -hmm. I was aware of the carbon footprint and felt bad about it. Now I'm just, yeah. Uh, the only thing I, I will do is my annual Tai Chi workshop in Mexico. I will. Hmm. One airplane a year or something. But uh, Canada, um, I have some, I'm so grateful and lucky to have. It's a small piece, but it's it's not even a beautiful piece of property, but the view from it, from it is beautiful. There's the Salish Sea and it goes up into Desolation Sound. So I see the sunrise um, in the morning and the reflection of the sunset because the island is not very large. Mm -hmm. So um, I think I sit there and look at the view a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and I have workshops that I have been postponing and postponing and postponing 
and now it's oh my gosh I, let's hope mm -hmm. August, september is you know and and um so that's important for me and to finish they've been very good this whole time but um to finish the work that i started there okay what kind of dogs are they uh i have a black lab who's very quiet and a little street sort of she looks like a mini golden retriever or like an arctic fox or something but she's the yappy one so yeah i i really appreciate this conversation um and getting a sense of you getting to meet you a little bit um is there anything else that you would like to add I think the dogs are telling us that we're done. <laughs> I think they might be trying to get my attention, yes. Thank you, you're a very good interviewer. I never would have thought of any of those questions. <laughs> you. Just, you know, it was just bouncing off of you. I will be interested and probably horrified, but I will be interested in, in watching this and seeing how, it, how I seem to be. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I really appreciate it. You've been you've been very generous with your answers. So we will leave this here then. Very nice talking with you, Heather. <laughs>